Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome. It's good to see you. My name is John Carn. I'm the pastor here at Light on the Corner Church, and you found us on our YouTube home. We are broadcasting from beautiful downtown Montrose, California. And it's a lovely day, as usual, here in God's country. Thank you, band, for that wonderful music. God is indeed a mighty fortress. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Please hit like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Hit that. Please hit like and subscribe. Okay? Appreciate it. We got a lot of uh, material to cover today. You can either take notes or just watch it twice. Whatever you think best. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Uh, why don't I just start with two true stories? Two short ones. One Sunday morning during junior church, that's what a woman said, we, we learned a song that included the line, he has conquered every foe. And when I saw a number of puzzled expressions, I explained that a foe is an enemy. And still thinking on my feet, I said that now, the name of one of our foes begins with the letter D. I was referring to the devil, of course. 
But I got some immediate insight into one family's politics when one child replied, oh, you mean the Democrats. Don't worry, I'll be fair. Okay, story number two. I should say true story number two. One Sunday, one Sunday morning, while I was brushing my nine-year-old daughter's hair, she peppered me with questions. I was doing my best to answer them when she looked up and out of the blue asked, Mommy, what are we, Christians or Republicans? Well, it's that season again. Have you noticed? Have you seen any political ads? Oh, they're out there, man. What is a relevant church, a Bible-believing relevant church, supposed to do during election season, just before the election? Shall we, uh, you know, cover our heads in the sand or hide our eyes or something and pretend there's nothing going on? I don't think that's good. Our church has four core values. We strive to be biblical relevant, authentic, and gracious. That's what we try to be around here. So I guess today's sermon would fit under the relevant category. But uh, before we start, uh, I think we should pray. So let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for trusting us enough to put us in these troubling days in which we now live. Grant us strength to be faithful and strong in this dark time. Help us to speak your truth, even now. Help us to preach. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, first, Democrat, Republican, or Christian? You may recall... Jesus was asked if it was right to pay taxes to Caesar. A loaded question, to be sure. And the answer Jesus shows us, the, the answer of Jesus shows us that we live in two worlds at the same time. Well then, he told them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Luke 20, 25. Simple, profound, meaningful. Christians have both the liberty and the duty to be good citizens. In fact, Christians in politics is a good thing. I don't know what it's like in your world, but in my world there's a constant drumbeat for pastors and churches to stay out of politics. They scold me and preach to me. So I preach right back because I take seriously that Jesus told us to be salt and light in the world. Imagine a country where the Christians do not influence the state. I've got a quote here. You can see it. If Christians are not engaged with politics, decisions will be made by people who think God is irrelevant and the truth of God's word does not exist. Wow. That's bad news. War correspondent, I'll take this a step further, war correspondent and wife of Ernest Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn, pushed back against remaining politically uninvolved. She said, and I quote, people often say with pride, I'm not interested in politics. They might as well say, I'm not interested in my standard of living, my health, my job, my rights, my freedoms, my future, or any future. If we mean to keep any control over our world and lives, we must be interested in politics. 
Well, I'll tell you, I quite agree. And so my colleagues who tell me to steer clear of putting our politics within a Christian worldview get an earful from me in return. You know, biblical citizenship is a Christian right and a Christian duty. A Christian right and a Christian duty. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God in the Bible. And John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, wrote, Providence has, that's Providence with a capital P, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty of, as well as the privilege and interest of, a Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for its rulers. How about that? Thank you, Mr. J. And you may be familiar with this quote from John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, who said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond civil government with the principles of Christianity. Wow. Well, these famous Americans sound just like our politicians today, don't they? But that's not my point. My point is, before you're a Democrat, before you're a Republican, you're something else. You're a Christian first. When you became a disciple of Jesus, you joined a family that will outlast your party, your government, your constitution, and your country. Your party will fail you. Ultimately, the Constitution will fail you. Your government will fail you. That's why you're something else first. So if you're a Democrat, I have something to tell you. I'm so glad you're here watching. Our church, including our church YouTube home, welcomes everybody, even Democrats and Republicans, Libertarians, Socialists, Communists, and Fascists. So y'all come. Why do we welcome all these people? Because Jesus is for everybody. You hear what I'm saying? Jesus is for everybody. Now, if you've tuned in and you're a Republican, I have something to tell you too. I'm so glad that you're here watching. Our church welcomes everybody. And if you're a libertarian, God bless you, you know, you're starting to make more sense to me, you libertarians out there. I, of course, never divulge my own political views in a sermon, usually. So, as we look ahead to November 5th, we would faithfully pray for a Trump-Vance administration. We have to pray for the administration because the Kamala is going to do a horrible, horrible job. That's my lousy Trump impersonation. Or we would also happily pray for a Harris-Waltz administration. Let me be clear, okay? I came from a middle-class family. 
I couldn't resist. Sorry. Anyway, I'll leave it to you to decide which political team needs prayer most. That's up to you. And by the way, you should know that this church uh, prays weekly against voter fraud. We hate voter fraud around here. Terrible. Now that's a threat to democracy, voter fraud. George Washington, who easily could have stayed in office indefinitely, they called him Your Excellency. After two terms, he turned over the reins to John Adams, who nobody liked, who in turn passed the power to Thomas Jefferson, and then he passed it to James Madison, and so on. And these people didn't even necessarily like each other. But they knew something that we don't. We never knew this. They did. They had had a king. And America was going to be different. God spoke to a man long ago named Abram in a place called Ur, which is today modern, modern day Iraq. And God called forth the father of a new nation, which would be named after Abram's grandson, Israel. Or Jacob. And of Israel, the Bible says this Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33 12. Another translation reads Happy is the nation whose God is Yahweh. Psalm 33. Now, we are not a Theocracy, like Israel, was, but the principle is still true for America. In fact, when the time came to design a national seal for the United States, Benjamin Franklin proposed an image of God parting the Red Sea for the Israelites and the motto, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. How about that, Ben Franklin? Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Thomas Jefferson suggested an image depicting the children of Israel in the wilderness led by a, a cloud and a pillar of fire. Our founders knew their Bibles. I wonder if our current leaders do. Dear ones, America has millions in case you're depressed this election season, America has millions of citizens whose God is the Lord, whose God is Yahweh. And may it ever be that we are Christians first. I'm serious about that. If you don't have that straight in your head, Get it straight now. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're a Christian first. Number two, political parties. America's founders did not initially recommend the political party system we so enjoy and fight about today. Listen to this. I have already intimated to you the danger of of parties in the state, with particular reference to the founding of them on geographical discriminations. Let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally. So said the father of our country, George Washington, in his farewell address, September 17, 1796, just three years before his death. 
I wonder if he was right. Soon, however, most had joined a political party. The thinking was that voters and politicians of like mind could and should band together for increased strength and influence with all due respect to President Washington. Political parties gave voters more of a choice. And soon, Alexander Hamilton's Federalists were duking it out with Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. And much has changed since then. You should know that in today's two-party system, either a Democrat or a Republican has won the presidency since 1852. Now, why am I talking about political parties? Because most of the time, Dear ones, our leaders vote along the lines of their party platform. Their party platform, which takes me to number three. See how fast we're moving? Party platforms. No one ever reads them. I do. Now listen. There are preachers out there who believe in patriotic religious liberty and more power to them, but sometimes they go too far, if you ask me, and they tell their congregations who to vote for. I hate that. What, what do you care who I think you should vote for? Who cares what the preacher thinks about who to vote for? I don't. Well, you'll never hear me tell you who to vote for. That's your business, not mine. I will, however, tell you who to believe in. God has called me to do that. But here's the problem. The gospel, we believe, requires us to make choices about daily life, choices for good and against evil, choices about faithfulness or unfaithfulness, loyalty or disloyalty to our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And he's not on the ballot. I won't tell you who to vote for, but I'll be happy to tell you how to vote. Vote like a Christian. Vote Christian values. Vote like someone who is captive to the word of God and obedient to the gospel. Since candidates belong to political parties, and political parties have platforms that tell us in detail what different candidates support, I think it's important to be aware of the platforms of the different political parties parties. Hopefully, your vote is an expression of your values, and hopefully your values flow from a Christian worldview. Both political parties have released vastly different platforms, as is usually the case. The Republican Party platform has not changed very much in the last four years, although it has changed. So I'll give you a a real brief synopsis of both. Uh, the Democratic platform is harder because it's 94 pages. So I'll do the Republican Party platform first. It supports, one, the sanctity of human life. That is, it is pro-life and seeks to limit abortions. Second, it has changed its stance, Republican Party platform has changed its stance on the definition of marriage, saying only that it values the sanctity of marriage. This means, dear ones, that the state has no idea what marriage is anymore. 
but the Republican platform kind of likes it and calls it, uh, gives it the term sanctity. That's nice. So the Republican Party platform has shifted a little bit. Third, the 2024 platform contains strong language of religious freedom. It declares that Republicans are, quote, the defenders of the First Amendment right to religious liberty, unquote, which it defines as, quote, the right not only to worship according to the dictates of conscience, but also to act in accordance with those beliefs, not just in places of worship, but in everyday life. It's a marvelous statement. Elsewhere, the platform promises that Republicans will champion the First Amendment right to pray and read the Bible in school and stand up to those who violate the religious freedoms of American students. Additionally, the platform pledges that Republicans will create a new federal task force to fight anti-Christian bias and to investigate all forms of illegal discrimination, harassment, and persecution against Christians in America. The platform states, we will keep men out of women's sports, ban taxpayer funding for sex change surgeries, and stop taxpayer-funded schools from promoting gender transition. Reverse President Biden's radical rewrite of Title IX education regulations and restore protection for women and girls. Notably, the comments on gender ideology in the 2024 platform are stronger than the 2016 version indicating how issues related to transgenderism, for example, biological males competing against females in sports, minor children accessing so-called gender-affirming care, etc., how these have risen in prominence. So that's reflected in the Republican platform this year. Okay. Halfway through, we're done with the Republicans. The 2024 Democratic platform includes a nearly 1,000-word section. It's longer than I thought. Uh, nearly a 1,000-year section titled Reproductive Freedom that outlines the party's stance on abortion. This marks a significant shift from 20 years ago, when I was just a kid, when the 2004 platform addressed abortion in just one paragraph, stating that abortion should be, remember this, safe, legal, and rare. By contrast, in the 2024 platform, it makes a, gives a full-throated, comprehensive case for legalizing abortion all the way up to birth. It laments the overturning of Roe versus Wade and expresses outrage that more than 20 states have enact, enacted laws to protect unborn children. The platform credit, credits President Biden with signing three executive orders and a pre presidential memorandum related to abortion and praises the administration for protecting access to chemical abortion drugs and creating a new path for retail pharmacies to dispense abortion pills. The platform promises to repeal the Hyde Amendment, if you remember what that is, the, the provision that bars the use of federal funds to pay for abortions, and to pass national legislation to make Roe versus Wade the law of the land again. And the platform promises to appoint pro-abortion judges. Regarding religious freedom, the Democratic platform condemns anti-Semitism. I'm glad to see that. It condemns Islamophobia and 
quote, the decades-long campaign to demonize the Muslim community. And it celebrates President Biden's appointment of Rashad Hussein, the first Muslim to serve as ambassador for international religious freedom. In terms of gender and sexuality, the platform endorse, endorses the Equality Act, legislation that would make sexual orientation and gender identity protected classes and federal non-discrimination law. The Equality Act is a nightmare for all who believe what the Bible says about sex and gender. Although not mentioned in the platform, it is important to note that the Equality Act expressly exempts itself from the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. What does that mean? This means that the government would not need to prove a compelling government interest or that it is acting in the least restrictive way when infringing on the religious beliefs of citizens. The platform also supports what it calls medically necessary gender affirming care. This would include puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgery. The platform celebrates that in just one term, the Biden administration tied the record for the most openly LGBTQ judges appointed. In addition to the party platforms providing a lens through which the two major parties can be evaluated, both of the major presidential candidates have a clear record on a wide variety of topics. Dear one, since we are, in truth, citizens of the kingdom of God, and this world is not our home, my view is that evangelical Christians should never feel completely at home in either party. Now, as you might expect, the Republican Party platform opposes uh, all of this. Uh, that is because, in truth, this is really not your grandparents' Democratic Party anymore. I don't think JFK or LBJ would fit in anymore. That's just an opinion, but I don't think uh, th those two presidents would foot, uh, fit in. And, and I know Thomas Jefferson wouldn't approve either. The truth is, dear ones, Jesus called us to be salt and light in a tasteless and darkened world. So the prophet David wrote, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Psalm 139. As men and women who fear the Lord, we do not seek to dismember in the womb the handiwork of God. We are captive to the word of God. And that book shapes our worldview, which in, ter in turn influences how we vote. That's the first thing. Second, I'd like to remind you of God's design for human beings and marriage. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh, Genesis 2. That should sound familiar. Man, woman, sex, 
marriage, and gender were carefully designed by a loving God. And we need to vote like these things matter because they do. A few years ago, one pastor wrote this. He said, you don't need to apologize for, for voting a Christian worldview which stands up for the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. The sanctity of life, sex, and marriage are three aspects of the Christian worldview that are hated by this world. Most Christians clam up and shut up because they're afraid to stand up. Well, I trust that's not you, dear ones. You're courageous, right? Aren't you? You're not afraid to vote like a Christian, are you? Now, consider this. President Biden has said that he personally agrees with the Catholic Church's teaching against abortion. But he would never seek to impose his religious values on someone else. And that attitude is precisely what I'm arguing against. Dear ones, there should be no wall between your spiritual and political self. God expects us to bring our Christian values into all of life, which includes the voting booth. Likewise, as you may recall, a few years ago, when Amy Coney Barrett was nominated for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, Feinstein famously said of Barrett's Christian faith, she said, the dogma lives loudly within you, and that's a concern. Remember that? You see, teach, why, why say that? Because teaching a class at Notre Dame, Professor Barrett had said this. See how you like this quote from a faithful Catholic. She said to her class at Notre Dame, it's always good to remember that a legal career is but a means to an end. And that end is building the kingdom of God. This is precisely what I'm arguing for. That Christian values live loudly within you. When the world hears your voice, may it hear God's voice. Let me put it this way, dear ones. It is far more important that we fear God's disapproval than man's disapproval, than people's disapproval. Everybody else is telling you their worldview. Why shouldn't Christians tell theirs? I think that's a fair question, don't you? So be brave in your comments. Be brave in the voting booth. Take Jesus with you, for goodness sake. And on November 5th, vote like a Christian. I'll close with you. You think about this, would you please? It's important. You've got a country at stake. Christian voters stay home by the, the droves. It's a catastrophe. All right, I'll close with this story. Uh, a lady said this, my mother's grandfather was a coal miner in the hills of eastern Kentucky. She called him Grandpa Joe. By all accounts, he lived hard, worked hard, and drank hard most of his life. When he was sober, he was the loving and beloved patriarch 
of the Klan. He told wonderful stories, and the grandkids loved to sit on his lap. But when Grandpa Joe was drinking, he would disappear for weeks at a time, choosing whiskey and brothels over wife and family. Late in his life, Grandpa Joe contracted liver disease from the alcohol and black lung disease from the coal mines. He was hospital, hospitalized, waiting for death to come. And my mother, who was 19 years old at the time, and a brand new Christian, went to visit her beloved Grandpa Joe. She cared about him and wanted him to know that God loved him. She wanted him to have the chance to respond to the, for, to the forgiveness available in Christ. So she sat by his bed and gently outlined the message of the gospel to Grandpa Joe. After listening politely to her presentation, Grandpa Joe looked up and said, You know... I don't believe I've ever sinned. And she was shocked because, my goodness, the whole family knew about his lifestyle. So she said, Grandpa, but Grandpa, we've all done bad things. Can't you think of just one thing that you've done that was wrong? He pretended to think for a minute and then said, you know, I take it back. I take it back. I have sinned. Once. I voted for a Republican. I'll leave it all right there with you and the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, for those of us who are old enough to remember the changes in America have been staggering. I pray that your stable hand will guide us through this bizarre election season. I pray that we would be at peace. I pray that we would hold fast to your design for us. Long past November 5th. And on that day, I pray that we would vote like a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen.